It's good to see you all. How is everybody doing this Wednesday night? All right, I got a good crowd here. Uh, I'm glad the rain stopped. People have a hard time driving to church in the rain. It's just a church rule. So uh, we're glad to see everybody here this evening. Uh, This summer series, Bill Search and I are tag teaming and giving Terry Fakes a much-deserved break here in the month of July. But he will be back in August whenever he kicks off his next series. And it's an exciting series that I cannot wait for, especially given all that's going on in our country. I'd encourage you to tell all your friends, make sure whenever we publish everything coming up in August, you, you, te- you check out Terry Fakes will be back. Uh, this series, we're covering all the things that, qu- that skeptics ask, the different questions going on. And it's a big topic, so before we get into it, I thought it was probably a good idea that we start this lesson in prayer. So, so let me pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here in this church. I thank you for the rain today. I thank you for uh, the clear weather right now. I thank you for everyone who has come here today. I thank you for everyone who's listening to us online right now. Uh, Lord, we do not take for granted that we get to gather in this place freely and joyfully and get to just engage in your word and be in your presence. And so we just say thank you. Uh, We recognize what a privilege it is in this country that we get that. And we just thank you. And we, we ask that you would be with all those around the world who don't get this opportunity. May you be with them in the most amazing of ways. We ask that you would be with our country right now as we're going through such a difficult time. We thank you for those who lead us. We thank you for all of those uh, in our country who serve each other and our communities. We ask that you would do the work to turn all of their hearts towards you. May you be with here with us right now. Holy Spirit, help us understand, open up our minds, open up our ears, open up our hearts. Uh, Allow this to be your message today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, this series... Questions Skeptics Ask, uh, something I'm really excited about. Bill Search started last week talking about the Trinity. Uh, I'm gonna spend the next two weeks uh, talking about Jesus uh, in, in various ways. This week, it, we're gonna hit it at a high level. Next week, we're gonna talk about something very, very detailed. Uh, but it, it raises the question for us right off the beginning on why are we even doing this series? Why are we talking about questions that skeptics ask? And and just to let you know that the reason we're doing this is not just so you have more information. Uh, That's not the sole purpose. We're doing this so you have sole information for a purpose. There's all kinds of recent studies out there right now that show that the majority of the people who start out as atheists or just don't have faith in Christ, that the way that the majority of them actually come to a faith in Christ is because they have someone in their life whether it be a family member or a close friend or just someone close to them, they have someone in their life who authentically lives out the Christian faith. And they get to see it and experience it. And they trust that if this person believes this in this way and has given their life to it, even if they don't understand all the questions, they tend to put their faith in Christ. And so for this series, and in particular for this lesson today, if you're a Christian in the room, I want you to learn some things that may just give you more confidence in your faith. I want you to learn some things to help connect your mind to some of the common questions you may have, but but for the reason of just allowing you to more fully surrender your life to Christ, right? So that you can live in confidence in your faith as you go about your days. And today, if you are in the room and you are not a Christian, or if you just don't know what you believe, First off, I'm glad you're here. If you're online listening to this and you're not a Christian and you don't know what you believe, I'm glad you're listening to this. I hope that in this lesson, you just have some questions answered for you. I hope you also see uh, that having faith in Christ is not something where you have to check your mind at the door. We can think about things, we can reason things. And and I hope what you'll see in the lesson today is that, that having faith in Christ is not only possible, it's actually very reasonable and very, very logical. And with all this being said, the big, big question I wanna ask today is this. Why should I believe this story about Jesus? Why should I believe this story about Jesus? 
And next week, we're gonna narrow this down and I wanna focus on the week of Jesus' death and resurrection and all the crazy questions that come with that week. But this week, let's keep it at a high level. Why should I believe this story about Jesus? And I'm going to dialogue the role of a skeptic all throughout this lesson. And the way I'm gonna do that is I wanna base the questions off, off of conversations I've had with a very real friend of mine. Uh, and, and I really, uh, I, this is a friend that I met and got to know really well in Australia. And just in case, like just in case she decides all the way from Australia to tune in and listen to this lesson, I'm not gonna use her real name, but I need you to relate to someone. Like I need you to see that I'm dialoguing with someone. And so I'm gonna substitute my friend from Australia with another famous Australian that you all know, my friend Margot Robbie. Right, so, so this is, as we go throughout this lesson today, I'm gonna to be referring to my friend as Margot, Margot Robbie. And you may ask yourself, Blake, was your friend really Margot Robbie? Maybe it was, maybe it was. That's for me and Margot to decide. Uh, but my friend Margot and I were talking one day and we were talking about religion. And this was, this was her response to me when we started talking about religion. She said this, and I'll never forget it. Margot, as, as we all talk often, she goes, Blake, you know what? The, all this religion stuff, all this religion stuff, it's just fooey. I'll never forget those are the words she used. It's just fooey. It's just a bunch of fooey. I don't believe any of it. And at that time, honestly, I had no idea how I was gonna respond to my friend Margot Robbie. I did not know. Like, I mean, she was a smart woman. She was sophisticated. She was a hard worker. Uh, she was a kind person. She volunteered a whole lot of her time to serve people in need. I mean, like, this was a good person. She wasn't trying to offend me with the statement she made. She genuinely believed what she said, that it was just fooey. She was treating religion, honestly, in a very similar way to how many of us treat just politics, right? It just all seems ridiculous. And so she was just throwing it out. But I didn't know how to respond to her. I didn't know how to respond even to that, that, that statement that it just all was nonsense. And so as I think about this first, I actually think to, to get to the question of how can you believe this story about Jesus, you've got to start at a high level and, and, and think about just belief systems in general. And my, my first point today is this. Everyone believes in something. Everyone believes in something. Even when they think they don't, they believe in something. And I highlight the word believe uh, in this slide on purpose. And if you've been spending any time under Terry Fakes' teaching, you will know that one thing he calls out often is this word belief. And I want you to, to substitute the word belief for the word that Terry always talks about, the word trust. I want you to just, when you hear believe, anytime you're in the Bible, think about the word trust. When you hear faith, think trust, right? And so everyone trusts in something, even if they don't know it. Everybody does. We all live our life in some way where we're putting our full trust in something. And a good way to get to the root of what people are actually putting their trust in is to ask them this question. What do you believe is the meaning of life? I mean, what do you believe it is? What is the actual meaning of life? How would you answer that question in your heads right now? If you just think about that for a few seconds. If someone came to you and said, hey, what's the meaning of all of this? What's the meaning of life? How would you answer it? Well, people have been trying to answer this question since the very beginning of time. And I wanted to give you a few examples of how different groups of people answer this question. The Stoics, a lot of you all know the Stoicism famous guy, Marcus Aurelius. The so Stoics believed that the meaning of life was this, to live in agreement with nature. They believed that the world had a certain design and construction and that you could use reason, your own reason, to help understand the design of the world and live within agreement of it. And these virtues that you would develop, these good habits would allow you to lean into that reason and, and live in a way that was consistent with the way the world had been ordered. And the Stoics believed that the highest state that you could achieve, the highest state of virtue, uh, was the highest state of wisdom, was this idyllic person called the wise man. 
And they believed that the wise man was as rare as a phoenix, but that was the ideal that you were aspiring to, right? Using our reason to develop virtues, good moral habits that would align within the construction of the nature of the world. That was the meaning of life. The Buddhist have a very different meaning of life. If you're a Buddhist, you believe that the meaning of life is to escape the cycle of suffering and death and rebirth, to seek enlightenment, as opposed to leaning into the construction of the world to understand the best way to live. It was very much the meaning was to escape the cycle of suffering of this world. The humanist, the humanist, and that's a term that we don't always understand, but you're going to recognize it. The humanists believe that there is only one life and we have to make the most of it. Does that sound familiar? There's one life and we've got to make the most of it. There is no single ultimate meaning of life. Instead, it is up to us to determine what our very own meaning is. Does that sound familiar? Right? Humanists believe that we should be free to decide how we live as long as we do no harm to others. It's something you're going to hear, by the way, every single day. Here's how you hear it right now, honestly, in our culture today is you go find your own truth. Sounds good. It's absolutely ridiculous, but it sounds good. I mean, even like this, this idea of, hey, you're free to decide however you want to live as long as you do no harm to others. It just, this is not in the notes, by the way, this is a separate lesson you're getting for free right now, right? But as long as you do no harm to others, you have to ask yourself, who gets to decide what the definition of harm is? If I get to decide and you get to decide, what if they're different? Who wins the argument, right? So a humanist though believes that it's not us using our reason to determine a complete ordered construct of the world, kind of like, like a stoic, but a humanist is saying we all get to decide for ourselves how we should live. So a couple of famous humanist quotes I wanted to read. I am a humanist. Oh, let, me, let me stop this for a second. My friend Margo, uh, going back to my friend Margot Robbie, you know, just to make sure I keep this dialogue here. My friend Margot, she did not realize it, but she was a humanist. And I guarantee you, most of the people in your life right now who aren't Christians uh, are humanists. They just don't know that's the label. But they believe that the way to live a good life is to determine what makes you happy, uh, what your own meaning is, to follow your own truth. Most of us go down this way. My friend Margot is the same way. Here's some good ways to explain it. I am a humanist, which means in part that I have tried to behave decently without rewards or punishment after I am dead. Humanists recognize that it's only when people feel free to think for themselves using reason as their guide that they are best capable of developing values. When you hear developing values, that's determining something that you say is the good, right? Developing values that succeed in satisfying human needs, again, that we have to decide what they are, and serving human interest, again, that we individually get to decide what our interests are, right? This is the idea of humanists, and this is the idea that really permeates all of our culture. So I just pause there for a moment on humanism. The best way I could say is, is this is the culmination of the current philosophy of the day. And if you are living a life where you're trying to live a life where the meaning is this idea, what you are putting your trust in is yourself. That is the ultimate source of all things. The culmination of all humanist philosophy shows up in uh, the great show, Ted Lasso. In case you've watched it, I haven't because it's highly inappropriate. But in case you've ever watched Ted Lasso, because uh, a friend told me about it, uh, the, it, the culmination of human philosophy shows up with the character Danny Rojas, who they say is a soccer player. And this is his life statement. If you know this show, you know, Danny says it all the time. He says, football is life, right? Football is life. What he's decided here is that his one goal in life, the thing he is aspiring to is football. That is the highest ideal and that is life. He's chosen his highest idea. But what we have to understand is that everyone believes in something. Everyone believes in something. Even if they don't know it, they believe it's something. And most of the time when you don't know what you believe in, what you actually believe in is yourself, right? We all have an idea, some sort of governance that is, that is guarding our life. We can't say it's all fooey because we all believe in something. So we have to figure out what do we believe in? And the crazy thing about Christianity 
is that, and this is my point number two, Christianity is different from all other belief systems. There is nothing like it. Whenever I asked you earlier, what is the meaning of life? We've answered that question in Christianity. Uh, if you go back to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, a great group of theologians came up with these answers and they asked the same question. In, in similar words, what is the meaning of life? And this was their answer. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To glorify God, there's some current debate in the theologians world today about should it be to glorify God, comma, enjoying him forever. But let's just go with this. This, is, this has lasted for a long time. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is the meaning of the Christian life. And that meaning is so unique from all other systems in the world. Christianity isn't just an idea or a way of living like Stoicism or humanism. It isn't an escape like Buddhism. It uses our reason. Christianity uses our reason and our intellect, but our reason is not the ultimate authority. Okay? It uses virtue as a way to form us, but the virtues point to something way beyond what we can reason on our own. Christianity is unique in that all the beliefs of Christianity center on a real person who lived in a real world who is still alive. It centers on actual events that occurred, real teachings that occurred with real people in real history. Where the humanist will say that we're trying to figure out how to live a good life without God, the Christian says we're trying to understand how to live in God and God in us and he is good. Where the Stoics point to this personified wise man who doesn't actually exist, the Christians point to a real man. Everything points to a real person. I want you to remember what Jesus said in John 14, five through six. Thomas is saying to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And look at what Jesus says. He doesn't point him to an idea. He doesn't point him to a philosophy. What does Jesus say? He goes, I am the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the way. We as Christians, we don't follow the teachings of a mere human who is trying to figure out some other way to live in this broken world like Buddhism. We follow one who was here in the beginning, who was with God in the beginning, who was God in the beginning, and through whom all things were made. We can ask these questions. Because of this, we can ask these questions. We can say, what is good and what is harm? And we know because we just looked to Jesus to tell us. We can ask the question, how should we live? And we just look to him. We can ask, what is wisdom? He is. What is love? He is. Why are we here? He has told us. Why is there suffering? He has told us. Can there be joy in this world? Yes, if we follow him. It all, it all points to him, a real man who came into this earth, who is God that we follow. Donald Hagner is a New Testament scholar, and he said this. He said, true Christianity, the Christianity of the New Testament documents is absolutely dependent upon history. At the heart of the New Testament faith is the assertion that God was in Christ reconciling himself to the world. The incarnation, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as a real event in time and space, i.e. as historical realities, are the indispensable foundations of Christian faith. To my mind then, Christianity is best defined as the recitation of, the celebration of, and the participation in God's acts in history, which, as the New Testament writings emphasize, have found their culmination in Jesus Christ. This all points back to actual things and an actual person that occurred. So here's the question that Margot Robbie would say then at this point in time in our discussion. She would say, okay, Blake, I see that this is completely different, but for your beliefs to be true, for what you're saying about Christianity to be true, then it tells me that this man, Jesus, truly had to walk on the earth. He had to be a real person. So I've got a question for you. How do we know 
that Jesus actually even existed. And remember, my friend Margot, it's a good question because she thinks everything's fooey. She looks at the Bible and she says, well, I'm not gonna believe that anyway. That's just a bunch of fooey too. So I want you to prove to me that Jesus Christ was actually here in this world. Prove it to me without the Bible. And now as, as people, all of us here in this room included, who have grown up in the West, in the Western culture, uh, we all look at everything with a very critical lens. We, we, we honestly, and you, you were like this too, this is how we've been raised, we believe that if we can't demonstrate it right in front of us, we don't believe it. That's just the lens we look through. And so I wanna actually tap into that lens. Can we demonstrate, not using the Bible, that Jesus Christ was real? It's a big question. Can we do it? And it gets me to point number three. There is good historical evidence for Jesus being a real person in history. There really is. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. Uh, because what are the odds, you, like, what are the odds that there would be good historical records that Jesus is actually a real person? Non-biblical records, what are the odds of it? Most of the historical records of the time uh, consisted around things that the emperors did, that the kings did, it would have been their edicts, their decrees, their letters. Uh, it, it all centered around people who had these big power structures in the world. It wasn't like today where everything we do is posted on social media and we have records of everyone. I remember during the last election campaign, you know, everyone had 500 pieces of data that social media companies were mining to make sure we all were getting political ads 24 hours a day, right? Like that, that data just didn't exist. It, all the historical records are pointing to these big, important people. And I want you to think about Jesus' life. He was from this backwoods area of, of Galilee called Nazareth. He wasn't anywhere near the seat of power in the world at Rome at the time. He never held any political office. He had no money. His following was not so massive that a bunch of people would have understood from the Roman world. He never waged war. His life in public, like Jesus' public life, was three years. What are the odds that history would record the life of a man I just described. It's actually really, really low. And there's a lot of really smart people out there who would tell you there's no records of Jesus ever existed. Bertrand Russell, in his famous, famous essay, Why I Am Not a Christian, which by the way, I just don't recommend you reading that, okay? If you wanna find something else to read, come out of class, just read the Bible more. Don't go read this essay. Uh, but in his essay, Why I Am Not a Christian, he said this, Historically, it's quite doubtful whether Christ ever existed at all. And if he did, we know nothing about him. And this is, again, this is a um, little side lesson that isn't in the notes, just a good tip for all of us. Don't always believe things that smart people say. Just because they're smart doesn't mean that they are right, right? Do your own homework. Bertrand Russell is not right. He's not right. But we have to be so careful when we see people putting forward things that sound good, but they're actually not right. One of the original church fathers said this line when he was talking about church heresies way back in the early church. And he said this, he goes, error never shows itself in naked reality in order not to be discovered. On the contrary, it dresses elegantly so that the unwary may be led to believe that it is more truthful than truth itself. We have to be careful when we're being lied to. Just because they're smart and they have letters after their name doesn't mean they're right. We have great evidence. Here's some quotes from some actual historians. Um, some writers may toy with the fancy of a Christ myth. So what that means, Christ myth, that's the idea that Christ is just a story. So some writers may toy with the fancy of a Christ myth, but they do not do so on grounds of historical evidence. The historicity of Christ is as axiomatic for an unbiased historian as the historicity of Julius Caesar. Does anyone in this room right now doubt that Julius Caesar really was here in this world at some point in time? Absolutely none of us do, no historians do. It's not historians who propagate the Christ myth theories to other people. Another one, Otto Betts, a New Testament scholar, says this, no serious scholar has ventured to postulate the non-historicity of Jesus. 
we have good historical facts. And I, and I brought a book along with me that I'm gonna recommend to you all. And it's a book that Terry's quoted before called Can We Trust the Gospels? And if, and if a lot of you have been here a long time, you might remember that this author, Peter Williams, actually came and did an interview with Terry here, I think like six or seven years ago, getting some nods. It's, it's nice to know I'm not completely off. Uh, but this is a great book. And, and a lot of the things I'm gonna quote here on out come from this book. But what I love about this book is that the academic scholarship is really, really good, but it's also very readable. You could sit down and read this just for fun. And so I really recommend this book. Uh, but Peter Williams has a few things that he references, and I'm gonna add some more to it, about non-Christian historical sources that help us know that Jesus actually existed in this world. And so the first one comes from a guy named Tacitus. And Tacitus held a number of Roman offices, including senator and consul. And he's very famous for his writings. And he was well known at the time in the Roman Empire being a guy who had high attention to detail. And he was writing a letter, and Terry's quoted this letter before. He was writing a letter about how Nero, the emperor of Rome at the time, had burned down Rome, and Nero was blaming it on all the Christians. And I want, to listen, I want you to listen to what he says. I want to talk about it within this context. It says, But neither human help nor gifts from the emperor nor all the ways of placating heaven could stifle scandal or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by the order of Nero. Therefore, to scotch the rumor, Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices whom the crowd called Christians. Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. And the pernicious superstition, talking about Christianity, was checked for a moment, only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital Rome itself, where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and become fashionable. Does this guy like Christianity? Absolutely not. This is not a pro-Christianity policy advocate. You know, this guy does not like Christianity, but we learn something from this letter. We learn that Tacitus tells us that Jesus was put to death when Tiberius was the emperor. And we can date that. Tiberius was the emperor from AD 14 to AD 37. That checks with what the Bible tells us. We also know that Jesus was put to death by this man named Pontius Pilate, which we can date that. He was governor of Judea from AD 26 to 36. That checks with the biblical account. There's another historical source from Pliny the Younger. And Pliny the Younger was a Roman governor. Uh, he also, just by the way, was a guy who was there to witness the explosion of Vesuvius when it buried Pompeii. And he writes some really cool accounts about it. That's not what this lesson is about, but if you ever have any more information, it's really cool. Uh, and so Terry's quoted this letter before whenever he was writing to the emperor Trajan. I just wanna read a few words from this as well. He's talking about the Christians and he's getting advice on how to handle these pesky Christians. He says, they, talk about the Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light and of singing in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and of binding themselves by a solemn oath, not to wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor to deny a pledge when they were called upon to deliver it up. And after this, it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake in food. What you see here in this is that everything he is saying correlates so well to what we read in the Gospels and the books of Acts. It speaks to this large spread of Christians shortly after the death of Jesus in the Roman Empire. This wasn't something that just happened. Christianity wasn't just something that happened hundreds of years later, and then these people hundreds of years later were trying to backtrack and create a history that they're making up. This happened really quickly. We have non-biblical accounts of it. And they are believing, they are exercising the core beliefs of Christianity that we understand today. All throughout the Roman Empire. This is before the Catholic Church is in power. This is before the Pope. This is before there would have been some power structure from the empire in any way to mandate these beliefs. This was all happening right in the time that we understand from the Gospels. 
We also have records from a guy named Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. He was actually the commander of the Jewish forces during the rebellion against Rome in 66 AD. And he was speaking about how when the Jewish high priest was trying to make the most of a power vacuum in AD 62, and this high priest did the following. It says that he convened the judges of the Sanhedrin and brought before them a man named James, who was the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and certain others. And he accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. Right in this account, what are we learning? there was actually a man in history named Jesus, right? Right there in that account, we see it. And he had a brother, James. The Bible tells us that too. Several decades after Jesus died, he still had family members who believed enough that he was who he said he was, that he was the Christ, that they were willing to die for it. Just like the Bible says. If we knew nothing else from just those accounts, we get a lot of factual information about Jesus. There's also another thing. There was this man named Thallus who was most likely around 80, 50, 51, 52, and he wrote the histories of the Eastern Mediterranean world from the Trojan War up until his own time. And in one of his books, he is so against Christianity that he goes out of his way to try to explain this crazy event that they all are continuing to talk about, the darkening of the sun. And this is actually something I'm gonna talk about next week in detail. But he is writing in his histories about this event where the sun went dark on the day that Jesus dies. He talks about Jesus by name, the event, and the time, just like the Bible says. And this is only about 20 years after Jesus' death. There's a Syrian philosopher in AD 70 who wrote a letter that we have from prison to his son, and he says this. He's contrasting Jesus to Socrates and Pythagoras, and he says these words. He goes, what advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after they killed him that their kingdom was abolished, dating back to when the temple in Jerusalem was overthrown by the Romans and Jerusalem was sacked yet again. Time after time after time, you get these non-biblical sources, again, many of which were antagonistic towards Christianity, and we learn a few key things. We learn from these documents alone that Jesus was put to death in the time frame that the Bible says, that he was put to death by the person the Bible says, that the accounts of him were captured, were recorded relatively soon after his life, not hundreds of years later, that the core beliefs of Christianity were being practiced early after Jesus died, long before a power structure, a power structure was in place, and that the supernatural events we're gonna talk about next week were trying to be explained by people 20 years afterwards in actual history books. We also see he had a family member who was still in the movement that is recorded. All of these things you see are corroborating every detail of the Bible when it comes to factual information right there in the text, telling us that this man, Jesus, if anything, he existed and lived in this world in a manner consistent with what we hear in the Bible. I think that's pretty cool, right? We know that he was actually here. That's a good confidence to have. Now, it begs the next question that my good friend Margot would ask me. But before I get to the next question that my good friend Margot would ask me, I recognize that we have covered a lot of information in a very short amount of time, and I can see you all glazed over just a little bit. And normally, whenever we get to this point in time in the lesson, Terry will take a little break, and he will ask you all to submit questions to him. And he will stand up here, and he will answer your questions with an incredible amount of wisdom and knowledge. I refuse to put myself into that. Each and every time I'm here, I will never, ever do that. But I'm gonna give you a little commercial break, right? Just a little commercial break. And just because it's political season, I'm gonna give you just a little political commercial break. So this is just a quick aside. But I get asked about politics all the time, about my own personal views, about what we should do, what we think is right. Uh, and what I'm about to tell you is have to, I have to say, this is not an official position of Crossings Community Church. You ready for this? Okay. Now, I don't know what's gonna happen in this election. 
pray for everybody. I hope it all turns out great for our country. I'm not sure what's gonna happen in this election. But four years from now, I know the answer. I know the answer to your hopes and your dreams. I know what will make everything right in this world. I know the answer. There's a new candidate getting in the race and I already have the t-shirt. In 2028, I want you to vote Blake in 28. Can I count on your support that we're launching this presidential campaign right now? All right, all right. You know, I tell people all the time, I became a pastor just so I could one day get into politics and carry the evangelical vote. That was, that was uh, the whole reason. So no, commercial over. All right, we are back to the lesson, right? So let's get back to what my good friend Margo would ask me. She would say, okay, Jesus was alive, but then all the things you believe come from the details in the gospels. How do we know that the details about Jesus in the gospels are actually true? How do we know? Well, I wanna start with the other side of that argument for just a moment. Let's pretend for a moment that the details in the gospels aren't true. What would have to happen to make them not true? Well, first, you'd have to have these four people, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all proactively write accounts of a man named Jesus and either make up the entire story or embellish it significantly for some sort of gain that we can't understand. That's one, one scenario where this could work out. The other scenario where they wouldn't be true is that people from another place in another time, later on in history, people outside of Israel where Christianity was spreading throughout the empire long after the deaths of Christ, they started writing accounts for some reason and they were able to find a way to make up all these details in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Hey, those are some options. But my last point in this lesson tonight is this. The simplest and the most logical answer is that the accounts given in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are true. They are true. And contrary to debate the opposite position that these books were all made up, it actually requires some really complex explanations. I wanna give you an example of this. Back before I got into the church world, I used to work in the corporate world. And in the corporate world, I worked for some big companies and we were always dealing with large processes. I mean, just if you ever worked in a big corporation, you're always dealing with a bunch of large processes. And so if we were running a report where, where something, if we were running these processes and normally the processes would give us some report or some variance analysis, it would just work like clockwork, about once a week, something would happen. Something would happen where something would break down and the report wouldn't work, or it'd give us an error message, or just something happened. And, and sure enough, every single time that happened, I'd have people come in my office and they'd say the same thing. They'd go, well, the system just decided to break, right? And, and I don't know what's going on, but it just isn't working anymore. It just doesn't wanna work. And I'm like, well, okay, hold on. Now that's one option, that the software programming decided on its own Right, with its own AI intelligence before that was even a thing, to change its coding without anyone asking it to. And when it changed its coding, it changed its coding in a way that was evil, right? that would hurt your processes. Right? That's option one, that's, that's the conclusion you've come to. Or option two, Bob in accounting just screwed something up again. Right? <laughs> evil, malevolent software programming out to kill us, or Bob, right? It was always Bob, right? We would just go figure out what Bob changed and we would fix it, right? The software was never able to think on its own. Now, scary, it kind of can now, but that's a whole nother lesson for another day. But when you look at these things, I'd always say, what's the most logical conclusion? You normally need to look for the simplest explanation. And if you look at through, I mean, we're gonna go through a lot of details in these gospels. And what I want you to see as we go through these details is that the best conclusion you're gonna to come to is it's true. Like it's actually very logical that it's true. Starts out with something we don't always think about a lot. The four gospel stories have actually always been together. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you, we always see it together today. We think of it as a kind of this, the gospel package 
But we can go back to early third century and we have evidence from France, Syria, and Southern Egypt all throughout the world that shows that these accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were always kept together. Again, that's before the Catholic Church, before the Pope could have tried to put that in place. The early church was guided by the Holy Spirit and kept these documents together. And the four gospels, it's a lot. We take that for granted. It's a really big deal historically that there are four independent accounts of the life of Jesus. And not only are there four accounts, but they are substantial accounts that provide us a better historical record of Jesus than we get of most emperors in Rome during that time. I mean, so when when Jesus was alive, when he was going through his ministry, the emperor at the time was a man named Tiberius. Tiberius reigned from AD 14 to 37. We talked about that a little bit ago. Tiberius at that point in time would have been the most important man in the world, right? He was the emperor of Rome, by far the most important man known all over the world. But I want to compare what we know about Tiberius in terms of historical records to what we know about Jesus in the Gospels. We actually have far more written words recorded from artifacts about Jesus than we do Tiberius. And the accounts we have of Jesus were recorded much closer to the actual events of Jesus' life. In the oldest original copies we have of the Gospels, We can date back to second and third century, but the oldest original copies we have about Tiberius go back to the ninth century. If you looked at this from a purely historical standpoint, what you would see is that we have better historical record of Jesus than we do Tiberius, which is really, really cool. But what about the details in the stories? What do we know about the details in the story? One of the things that gives me so much confidence that the gospels are true was the mastery of the details all throughout the stories. And again, I would really encourage you to pick up this book. If you, if you come out of this lesson, you're like, well, that was kind of interesting. Pick up the book, you're gonna love it. But one of the things they, they, got, they got right was the details on geography. The four authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they referenced 26 distinct towns and villages in the region, and they referenced them all apart from each other in a consistent manner, meaning they never contradict each other with the specific occurrences and the factual information about the towns and the cities. And they also do this with 13 distinct regions. They do it with five distinct bodies of water, seven distinct areas of interest that would have only been known by people who understood the culture and the region at the time. They even got the names of the local plants right. Well, they were referred to going up properly and going down properly. What I mean by that is this. I'm getting ready to, next weekend, I'm gonna go to Dallas to see my sister. When I say I'm going to Dallas, what I normally say, am I going up to Dallas or down to Dallas? We're going down to Dallas. If I go to Kansas City to see a baseball game, where am I going, up or down? I'm going up. It seems like a little detail, a normal thing, but if you are some imposter trying to write the gospels and you're writing stories about routes taken from all these different villages and everything, and you're in a different time in a different place and you're trying to forge it all, you don't know, you don't know. But they get their ups right each and every time. They get their downs right each and every time based on the elevations of the various villages and cities all throughout the region. What this tells you just with these little details is that the people who wrote the gospel stories were so aware of the regions and the locations that they either lived there and just wrote down what happened, or they were like some of the most skilled academic scholars of their time trying to figure all this out. Now we see this with geography in place, but we also get clues all throughout the gospels that we know they were recording events that were consistent with the time as well. And this is what I mean by that. Um, Have you ever noticed that you can age a person based on their name pretty darn well? So my example, I'll give you, my, my four grandparents are named this, Eugene, Hazel, Daryl, and June. Eugene, Hazel, Daryl, and June. And when I say it, my central Kentucky accent starts to come back. So now I bet just by the name of my four grandparents, you all could name within 20 years of when they were born, couldn't you? Right? You don't know too many Eugenes being born in the last few years, do you? 
right? Yeah. If, if, if you look at the year my grandmother was born, I call her Nanny, the most popular girl names at the time were Mary, which I'll, I'll give that one, Dorothy, Betty, and Helen. Not too many Dorothy, Betty, and Helens being born in the last few years. Actually, right now, the most popular girl names today are Olivia, Emma, and Amelia. I think they're all very beautiful, great names. But what you can find is that based on the actual names that are recorded in the stories, you can date things. You can do that today. You can even use names to date geography. When I grew up in central Kentucky, I lived there through eighth grade, and I was the only Blake I ever knew. There were no other Blakes but me. When I moved to Oklahoma my freshman year of high school, I went to Deer Creek when it was a small school. There were five Blakes in my first class, right? We can, do, we can study names and we can, know both time, we can know information about both time and geography. And I love what Williams does in his book as he analyzes all this because he uses math to show some cool things. And as a finance guy by heart, it just makes me happy. So what he quotes is he went through this scholar who looked at Jewish documents from, Pal from the Palestinian area at the time that would have been consistent with the time of the gospels. And he looked at all of those documents and he looked at the names that were recorded and he looked at the most popular names of that time. Then he compared the same names and utilizations in the gospels. And what you see is that the, the percentage of people being recorded in the gospels and acts compared to the other documents of the time, it's almost the exact same percentages being used from how many people have those names which just tells you, again, it tells you again, either these people who were recording the Gospels were just there hanging out next to Simon, Peter, Mary, and Martha, right, and just recording the stories about what happened, or, again, they were the most educated academic scholars of their time doing incredibly sophisticated research on name and geography that we have ever understood to make these accounts work out. Because even if you were a Jewish person in Egypt, the percentages of how names of Jewish families in Egypt are very different than this distribution. It matters both what the time was and what the place was, and the gospel writers got it right. They got it right. The most logical explanation for that is what? They just wrote down what happened, All right? That's the simplest explanation. And I just think that's really cool. So, as you get into this conversation, like I just imagine, if I'm having this conversation uh, with my friend Margot, uh, at this point in time, her head would be beginning to hurt. You know, she has a very different expression on her face. This is a lot of information as we go through. Uh, everyone's trying to absorb all of this. So I just wanna hit a, a couple rapid fire questions that help give us more confidence that this story of Jesus actually is true. And Margot would ask me as we were talking, well, well, maybe all these details are right, and maybe they got their geography right, and maybe they got their names right and all of this, but what about the miracles? You can't tell me the miracles actually happened. That can't be true. They had to make those up. Well, just think about that for a moment. If you, if you start with the intellectual position that miracles are not possible, then it's gonna be really hard for you to ever prove any miracles occur unless they happen right in front of your eyes. And even when that happens, you'll try to explain it away. But it actually takes a whole lot of faith to believe the other idea. It takes a whole lot of faith in your own understanding to believe that you know everything there is to know about the universe and that you can explain everything that can be explained about the universe. That's a lot of faith in yourself to know that you're capable of that much understanding. And also from a logic standpoint, doesn't it seem logical that if they got all those details right, all those little details about the cities and the lakes and the cultural regions and the names and geography and all those, the ups and the downs, if they got every single one of those details right, the little things, doesn't it make sense that they'd also get the big things right? Logically, doesn't it seem reasonable that if the little is right, the big things would be right as well? I think it's just fascinating. And the last, the last big question, that, and we get this all the time, and I've had this conversation with my friend Margo also, is this. Well, maybe the stories they recorded were initially true. 
Maybe what they wrote down at the very beginning, that was true and they were being authentic. But you know how this works. The Bible has just gotten translated so many times over and over and over again that by the time we're what we're reading now, it isn't anything like what those guys wrote down. So how do you explain that? Why should I believe that what we read now is consistent with what was originally written all those years ago? And I don't wanna reteach Terry's lesson on this. If you were not here for his last series, he did a great job articulating the reliability of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I'd really encourage you, if you're online and you haven't seen this, go to resources.crossings.church, go to his last series. He does a brilliant job of explaining all of that in, in just incredible detail. But I'll just say this one little thing, because I have this conversation with so many people all the time. Most people believe that the Bible has been translated like the telephone game that you play as a kid. That's what they believe. They believe that, you know the telephone game where you whisper a word in somebody's ear, they go around the entire circle whispering in someone else's ear. By the time it gets to the end, it's a completely different thing. That's how they think the Bible is translated. We take one original, it gets translated, it gets translated again from that translation, translated again from that translation. Some guy in Syria adds something about a donkey, then it gets translated again, and, and by the time it gets to today, it's just a completely different document. That's what most people actually think. You know, nothing wrong, that's just what they think it, it happens. That's not what happens. When we translate the Bible today, we take the what you read today is translated from the oldest original sources we have so that we update the language and we update that, but we don't go through that entire process. We go back to those original sources. And so what you read today, and like I said, Terry does a great job demonstrating this, what you read today is reliable, right? It is what was originally recorded. And so as you go through all of these things we discussed today, as you piece it all together, I hope you keep coming to the conclusion that it's all true. It's all true. That the simplest and the most logical answer to all of this is that the story of Jesus as we see it in the Bible is true. And I take great comfort in that. Great, great comfort in that. If you're going to give your life to something, if you're going to devote everything you are to something, it is a good thing to know that it is true. What have we learned in this lesson today? Just recap what we've learned. Everyone believes in something. Everyone believes in something. Even when they don't think they do, they believe in something. And if they don't know what they believe in, they believe in themselves. That's what they're putting their trust and their faith in. We need to engage everybody with what do you believe? And to believe in Christianity, Christianity is so different than anything else. It is based not, an, not on an idea, not on a pure philosophy, but it is based on a person, an event. It is something that is rooted in real history. That is distinct from everything in this world. And since what we believe is rooted in history, rooted in the man named Jesus Christ, we can see in non-biblical resources that Jesus actually lived in this world and the details of his life from non-biblical sources corroborate all the details we know from the gospel. There's no contradiction. And then when we dig into the details of the gospel accounts, the stories where we learn the most about Jesus, we find over and over again that the most logical answer is that it is true. Using your mind and your reason, it is true. Now, I want to remind you of why we are here doing this series today. I hope you walk out of this room as a Christian. I hope you walk out of this room with confidence that your faith, your faith is true. It can be trusted that you can trust that everything you've been taught is actually right. The great story is true. And if you just walk out of here trusting it a little bit more, my prayer is that you would live a life more authentic, more fully surrendered to God, because that is what people will see. They may not pick up the story. They may not pick up this book. They may not come to Christ from an intellectual capacity, 
but many times they will become, they will come to know Jesus because you know Jesus so well. And if you just trust, trust in it all, live your lives more fully surrendered than you started when you came in here today, how awesome would that be? If you are not a Christian in this room today, I hope you walk out of here with more appreciation that this book, the Bible, is not just a bunch of people trying to fool you. It's a real story of a real event in history. It is true. Next week, did Jesus really claim to be God? All right, all this may be true, but did he actually even say that he was God? That seems like a pretty big deal. Can't he just be a good moral teacher? Right? Can't we just let Jesus teach us some cool stuff and move on down the road and forget all this supernatural garbage? Surely that whole story of what happened on the cross had to be made up. Next week, we're gonna dig into the last week of the life of Jesus. We'll talk about the sun being dark and it's gonna be a fun, a fun class. I'm a little biased because I'm the one teaching and prepping the lesson, but you're gonna love it, all right? Come back next week. I can't wait to see you there. God bless you all.